name of it is Every Day is Memorial Day. And today we celebrate Memorial Day. And uh, for all those men and women who fought and died for our country, we have a couple other days, Armistice Days and Veterans Day. But uh, this is the day we honor those who didn't make it home. And uh, what a blessing that is. And, and, and you wonder maybe where it all started. So in April 1863, in Columbus, Mississippi, after decorating graves of her two sons who died representing their beloved Southland, you know who that was, the rebels, and an elderly woman walked to two mounds of dirt at the corner of the cemetery to place memorial flowers there also. And someone said, what are you doing? Friend shouted, those are the graves of two Union soldiers. Yankees. Softly, that compassionate mother said, I know. Also know that somewhere in the north, a mother or a young wife mourned for them as we do for ours. And that was the beginning of Memorial Day, remembering those soldiers who fought and died. That loving deed set in motion our celebration. We honor that war dead once a year, but their sacrifice is evident, what? Every single day of the year. And today we want to honor the memory of all those who sacrificed their lives on the altar of freedom. And uh, again, as that song shared, that freedom is where we got from the Lord. That's where true liberty is at. And, and uh, that's what our forefathers fought for. And they stood up for that freedom. Not all believers, I never say that, but they stood up for Christian principles and morals. And they fought and died for it. And uh, thank for them. Uh, thousands sacrificed their lives and they weren't given in vain. Because of their sacrifice, we're free today to meet. And have the right to assemble our lives together and worship our God. And here's some numbers there. Revolutionary War, 25,324 people. Civil War, 498,332. Now, uh, if you check, you'll get some figures that may vary just a little bit. But uh, anyhow, gives you some idea. World War I, 116,710. World War II, 407,316. Korean War, 54,546. Vietnam War, you know, for so many years that wasn't even considered a war. But uh, by the looks of it, at 58,098, I would say that was a war, wouldn't you? And then the first Gulf War, 293. And, and when I looked at that, I said, you know, boy, that's not very many. But you know what? When it hit home in your house and your father or your brother or your son or your daughter, uh, your mom, uh, it one would have made an effect in your life. The Iraq War, 819. Afghanistan, 1921 is the last figures that I found, could find on that one. And uh, so we want to today thank those men and women who fought and died for us. And then when Jesus came into this world, whoops, got the wrong spot there. We got going... Today, I, I don't want to diminish that sacrifice and service of those men and women who have served our nation so faithfully and so valiantly. But I want to talk about one great soldier. This great soldier stepped onto a harsh battlefield one day. He took up arms and entered the fight that we know would cost him everything. This soldier bravely entered the battlefield and won a great victory. But at a terrible price, this great soldier gave his life not for a single nation, but what? For a whole world. His life was not given in vain, but the sacrifice of his life served to set free the captives of sin. And uh, for the child of God, every day is Memorial Day. We have been set free. We need to remember the sacrifice of heaven's greatest soldier. And uh, so that's what we want to do. The verse before us today, it used to be an ancient hymn in the early church. And in six short stanzas, it tells us about the gospel of grace. And I would like to look at this brief but powerful song. And, and, and I want to spend a little time here because I want to make sure, as I always have, that every person sitting here knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you would die today, that you'd be in heaven. Those teachers and those 19 kids had no idea 
that they were going to face eternity today, the day they went to school. And, and, and you know, we're none of us are sure of tomorrow. And, and, and so I, I want to make sure we understand that exactly what's going on. Uh, number one, uh, it says here, we'll, we'll read it, it's just one verse, but I'm going to get you all through your Bible. So if you wear it out, I told you, I'll buy you a new one. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. So I don't know if anybody's put music to that. Maybe we ought to figure out how to do that. And uh, they did somehow. They sang it in, in the ancient church. Of course, they sang they sang lots of the psalms and stuff. We have some of those. But uh, in the phrase, God was manifest in the flesh. And uh, so on your outline, may we always remember his what is appearing. Uh, it reminds us one of the greatest events in history. And I, I, I know you know that. It reminds us the moment that the creator, God himself, stepped out of eternity into time and came into this world as a human baby. Uh, the incarnation, Christmas. That's an, that's an inc incredible event that God would come of all things as a baby. And he laid aside his heavenly address, just like every soldier does, right? Every soldier who's ever served in the armed forces, when he would leave and fight the battle wherever it's at, and he'd have to give up his, heaven, his address. When Jesus came to earth, he also left his home. He had from all eternity lived in heaven. He had existed in a place of what? Perfection. Free from sin. Free from pain. Free from suffering. And free from sorrow. But I don't know why he left. I think that sounds like heaven to me. It sounds like a pretty good place to be. But he did. And uh, he originated in a land where he was exalted, honored, and worshipped. Yet he willingly left all behind to enter this sin-cursed world. Hate filled the world. He came to a world, and it says in John 1.11, he came to the world, but the world received him what? Yeah. Not. He came to a land where he would be ridiculed, hated, killed. Yet he came anyway. <coughs> he came to a land where he would, uh, uh, God came to the earth and he robed himself in human flesh. John 1, turn with me just there just for a moment. I want you to make sure you base these facts upon the word of someone asks you why you believe that he came, that God came in the flesh, that you would go to John chapter 1 and verse 1 and verse 14. It says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word what? Was God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He said he came and he tabernacled. That's what the word in, used to mean, tabernacled. He came and dwelt among us. He lived among us. So you could what? You could touch God. And uh, he, he lived as a man, among men, and he died as a man, that he might redeem man and that, and that may we never forget that our savior is no ordinary man but he is God in the human flesh and we've talked about that but I, I want to make sure you understand that if he wasn't God in his flesh then your salvation is gone we, we talked about that Jesus laid aside his heavenly apparel when a soldier enters the army he ceases to wear the same clothes he wore as a civilian matter of fact most of them wear a different hairdo too right I I, I I hear all the stories that the guy cutting hair say, what kind of haircut do you want? <laughs> you all got the same one. And, uh, uh, but, uh, and different clothes. You, you, you wore a uniform. And you wore a uniform that represented your nation. You know, and then we used to, in the Civil War, it was the blue and the gray, right? And so often they were referred to in that way. You knew it was a blue, it was a Yankee. If you knew it was a... Uh, gray it was from the south and uh, and 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 being a rebel and, and so uh, uh, there we go and, and when he 
the Navy, I, 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 you see them, the Navy and the Marines. I have a couple members of the family that were, and then the Air Force. They're different uniforms. You could tell which which group you they were with, and uh, so uh, uh, and that's what happens when Jesus came into the world. He took upon himself a new appearance. Remember, Jesus used to be with the Father forever, and he was a spirit. You understand that he existed eternally as a spirit. Now he's going to take on a what? A body. And, and, and it, from what I read, then he start, this is, when he comes in as a baby, that's his body that started. Then guess what? For every eternity, he'll always have what? A body. And one day when you get to heaven, as we'll get there, you'll see those scars in his wrist, scar on his side, where the thorns maybe were on his forehead. Maybe the stripe's still on his back. Uh, but he's still going to be what? He's going to be all God and he's going to be all what? Man, that's, that's an amazing thing. So one day, I can't wait till I can give him a hug. I'd like to just walk up to him and give him a hug. I don't know if, if I just will just fall at his feet and be there. But anyhow, he says he is still a friend and he's still, but he is God. And one day we'll get to hug him. And we won't need any walkers. We won't need any braces or none of those things. We'll just walk and our sciatica won't go out. And we'll just, we'll just be, and we can get on the ground and get back up. You know, uh, that, that seems to get harder all the time. Uh, Shirley says, if, if I get down there, you're going to have to go get a forklift to get me up. And uh, so that, that's the way it goes. God was manifest in the flesh. He laid aside his hand and, and, he, and he, he took on an earthly frame. Philippians chapter 2. A little farther over in your New Testament there. Philippians chapter 2. Paul describes some of that. Chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8. And, and, and he, he says there in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, or in, in the NIV says, Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's one of humility. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, that could, word could be translated slave, and come into come in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross to come and he took on a body now bodies human bodies have limitations remember Jesus didn't have any limitations now the new glorified body understand doesn't have the same limitations because Jesus would walk right through doors and he'd pop up in rooms and he would go to heaven and he'd come back down and uh, all those things uh, were, were with this new body. But at this one, he limited himself. He emptied himself. That's the kenosis theory. If you don't know that word, the word empty there means kenosis. It means he emptied himself of independently using his heavenly attributes. And he did everything under the control of the Holy Spirit and of the Father. Remember, he says, I only do what my Father says. And, and he did that. So it limited him. That's why he said it was good that he would go away. Remember? The disciples said, you're not leaving, are you? He said, it's good that I go. Because he's only in one spot. He said, but someday the Holy Spirit's coming. And wherever you go, he'll be inside you. And he goes with you. And so, because Jesus limited himself with a human body. And so, uh, uh, so that's what it says there. And, uh, and he came here as the creator of the universe, born as a baby in Bethlehem, and he had no place to lay his head. Matthew 8, 20. Here was God who made everything that was and who said, If I were hungry, I will not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Psalm 50, 12. And guess what? He's laying in Mary's bosom as a baby. Guess what? He had to depend upon Mary for food. And Joseph, however long Joseph was in the picture. Because Jesus left heaven and came into the world, he knew, as he lived, he knew what pain's like. 
Everyone here that I'm looking at has experienced a little bit of pain. Jim's been experiencing some pain. And uh, I know that this guy right here has been experiencing some pain. Julie's been, uh, her sciatic has been letting her know that it's there. And I know what those things tell you. They tell you about pain. Jim, Jim gets it especially on Sundays and Wednesdays. And <laughs> Lois is a, suffering that pain. Darrell's suffering that pain. But he knows what it's like to suffer pain. And he knows what it's like to be suffering. And he knows what it's like for rejection. Hunger. Thirst. Loneliness. And many of the other problems that are part of the human condition. But he, he, he did all that so that he could be a, a faithful high priest. Look with me at Hebrews. A little farther back in your New Testament. Hebrews chapter 4. Telling you about our divine soldier. Verse 14. Chapter 4 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest. Who cannot sympathize with our what? Our weaknesses. But was in all points tempted as we are. Yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. No matter how you're feeling, what you're suffering, what you're going through, guess what? Jesus understands. Sometimes it's hard to get a sympathetic ear, right? And you can go there and he understands. Even if you failed and did something you shouldn't do, he's still what? He still understands. He's a time of grace, a time of need. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty needy. <laughs> Hebrews 2.18 tells us about the same thing. For, it, for, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. You believe Satan's out there tempting people yet? Yes. Oh boy. He's out there. And you know what? He tried to get Jesus to fall for that same thing three times there in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't give in to that temptation. When you're getting ready to give in, start calling to Jesus. <laughs> Say, Jesus, help me. And, and that could be so many things. It could be something simple as what? Gossip. Slander. An adultery situation. People working in workplaces. People throw themselves at different people and all those things can happen. You think the enemy doesn't know that? He knows who your Jezebel is. And he knows those kind of things. And, uh, uh, but Jesus understands those temptations. Now, he never gave in. I wish I could say that. You know, road rage. I know you never done that. <laughs> those crazy drivers out there. <laughs> and, uh, and of all ages. Uh, they can't drive in their own lane. They, you know, they don't use turn signals. Uh, and then they use turn signals, but they don't turn. And all these crazy things. I never know whether to go or stop or wait or what. You know? And then the person behind you doesn't like it because you're waiting. So they're honking their horn because you didn't make a move. And I said, well, hey, buddy, I'm not. They have their turn signal on, but they're not turning. <laughs> And then, you know, uh, so there we go. So I get that way. And then the verse that was one of our memory verses, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on him for what? He cares for you. Don't forget that we have a, uh, Jesus is all God and he's all man and he understands life. And uh, he understands when things go wrong. He says, cast your cares on him. And remember, I, I, I've used that example and I've had it used on me that it's like fishing. You cast it like that, but you're supposed to leave it out there. But well, sometimes we reel it back in and that care comes right back and starts haunting. And we get anxious and, and all that anxiety comes on us. And I know you all been there. I, I, I know all these things up here. Sometimes I don't live them out of here. <laughs> and I start worrying. I start, or as Christians, we don't worry. We're just concerned. We're just concerned. Overly concerned. And uh, it can get to us. And uh, he came in the flesh. When Jesus came into the world as a man, he lived life as a man. He died on the cross as a man. He rose again as the dead from a man. And he ascended back to heaven as a man. 
May we always remember his accomplishments as we got back in our, our text there in, in, in First Timothy. So don't forget that he came so that he might live as a man. And then in Timothy 3.16, there again, if I can find my spot, there we go. God was manifest in the flesh. He appeared. He was justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. And those phrases, Paul kind of outlines the gospel for us and exalts Jesus for his accomplishments. I re one of my favorite words that Jesus said on the cross as he died, it is what? He said he finished all the work that God gave him to do. He accomplished that. And I'm, I wish I could say that in my own heart, that I've done everything that God would have me to do. And, uh, uh, but Jesus could. And remember his perfect service. The phrase justified in the spirit and seen of by angels speaks of God's divine approval. That was upon his life and work. From the time that Jesus was baptized in Jordan, remember the Holy Spirit came down like a what? A dove. And it says that Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Luke emphasizes that. And he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do everything he did as a man. So are you. You can no longer say the devil made me do it. Flip Wilson. <laughs> I know that dates us, but I think we're all here old enough to remember Flip Wilson and, uh, and Geraldine. But then <laughs> he was transgender and I forgot that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. And you know what? If you're not a Christian, you can say that because you're under the control of the devil. But he says now that Jesus was justified in the spirit and that Holy Spirit came upon him. He began his early ministry and the power of the Holy Ghost of the Holy Spirit was upon him. And uh, he perfectly accomplished what Adam failed to do. And so he was the second Adam in Romans. The miracles, the powerful teaching, the changed lives and the statements of God the Father. In Matthew 3, 17, and we just looked at it, Mark, not too long ago, that where it says, the Father was pleased. Well, look with me there, Matthew 3, 17. And that suddenly, and this is after the transfiguration, and suddenly a voice came from heaven, and Mark it was, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then it tells us that same thing in, in uh, Matthew 17, and verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And here's the one right after the transfiguration. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Listen to him. He says in another part of the scripture, he said, I always do what pleases my father. He had God's divine approval. How do I know that? Because of the miracles he did. The life he lived. The people's lives he touched. And he was pleased. It says there again that he was seen of angels. Angels were involved a lot in Jesus' ministry, right? It announced his birth. One came to minister to him after he was in a desert 40 days with no food and tempted three times by the devil. Uh, and God sends angels to minister to his children. And uh, again, a, a divine stamp of approval. They watched and, and, and it says the angel still didn't understand everything. They watched as their creator was born. That had, that had to be an incredible thing to watch as the Creator was born. They watched as they lived among men and fulfilled the plan of God. They watched as he what? Died. Just waiting for his orders. Because remember what Jesus said? He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have called angels. And uh, so when Jesus came into the world, he was born, he lived and died without sin. 
And that's important. He was the son of God. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by the angels. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, and uh, look there with me too. Like I said, if I wear your Bible out today, we'll, and this will end in a good spot for our communion service next week. Uh, but I don't want to forget the, also the ending for our, our, our uh, memorial service today. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I hope I don't go too fast for you there to get to that passage. For he made himself who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We call that the great exchange. The great exchange. His righteousness is credited to what? To my account. So now when God looks at you, he sees who? Jesus. And he said of Jesus, I am what? Well pleased. Your eternal position is safe and secure in God's eyes. God is well pleased with you because you put your faith in Christ and all your sins have been paid for. He was sinless. And he satisfied the justice of God. Someone had to pay for your sin. Someone had to. Jesus did. And so because of that you are justified. You're declared righteous. And that means more than as if I've never sinned. It's just as if I was Jesus and I had never had sinned. Perfect. That that's, says it's imputed to us. That means to place into your account. When God looks on your bank account, he sees it what? Paid in full. All those sins were there. You were in the red at one time. <laughs> and you were way in the red. And God put it all in the black and says, Jesus paid it in full. That's imputed righteousness. That's what we got. And, and so he was, he, he was perfect in his service. He's per, perfect sacrifice, as I've already shared with you. Speaks about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He was justified in the spirit. And how do I know Jesus was justified? Because he rose out of the grave. That, 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 that tells you that. You see, Jesus did not just come to the world to live. He came to die. That's what his... Remember, Peter says, what? First time he shares with him, I must go to Jerusalem. I must die. I must be buried and raised again. Peter says, no way. You remember what Jesus told him? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> he says, you're not, you're thinking as man. God had this plan that doesn't make sense. Now, you have to admit it. It doesn't make sense that God would come down and pay the price for my sins and make the plan so simple that even a child could understand it and yet confuse the, the brightest adult because he just can't understand why God would do something like that and he got to figure it out. You know, I don't figure it out. I just by faith say, thank you, Lord, for doing that and did all these things. And it doesn't count on my works. So it's not all those things. It was a perfect sacrifice and he came to die and die he did. And uh, death, after all, was, deserved for, was reserved for sinners. The Bible says that for the wages of sin is what? Death. death. That's talking about eternal separation from God. And uh, so in 1 Timothy, it says that Jesus came in and died for sinners. And it's the only way our sins could be paid for. Because there is a payday for his appointed unto men once to die and then the what? The judgment. Hebrews 9.22. When Jesus died on the cross, he suffered in ways we can never imagine. Physical, I believe, was nothing compared to the spiritual battle that went on when Jesus died that day for those three hours of darkness. When all the sins of the world were laid upon him. I don't know that I understand that either. But that's when that sacrifice, that's when the justice and holiness of God met the grace of God. And it was there that my salvation was, was purchased. Why did he do that? You. You. He died that you might have life. We might get through this. Uh, no, we won't. Forgot the other page of my notes. 
He shed his blood to redeem you from your sins and make it possible for you to be saved. And his death made whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Made that possible. A real possible body. Let us remember a man who took our sins upon himself and died in our place on the cross. He went to the grave. Three days later he rose. And we want to make sure we remember that the resurrection of Jesus from dead was God's amen. It was God's amen to everything Jesus claimed to be. He was a perfect in service. He was perfect in sacrifice. And he gave us a perfect salvation. The Jews, what? Rejected Jesus. So what did he do? He went to the Gentiles. Same thing Paul did. Peter was to the Jews. Paul went to the Gentiles and preached unto the Gentiles. Now, I, 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 the last point I want to make sure his salvation is proclaimed and we need to be doing that. We need to be sharing the gospel on this Memorial Day. You know, I don't know how many of those men and women that died for us went to be with the Lord. And I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Because there's two destinations, but I want to look on the bright side. And I pray, I pray that every one of them went that direction. But I know that that's not true. That's hopeful thinking. Because it says that many, many go down the wrong road, right? And, and the right road to salvation. And, uh, but we have men and women still going out to battle. We did have chaplains that were proclaiming the gospel, and now we got some that are, have, have left that aside and are doing other things. But it's important that we know when a guy or a woman goes to battle, I pray that everyone will get saved before they will go to battle, because we don't know when we're coming back. Like I said, for those little kids, God has a plan. And uh, I'm going to leave that in God's hands for those 8, 9, 10 year olds. And I know some people want to say the age of accountability is 12 and all that. I, I, I'm just not going to get into that. I know that God does what's right. And, uh, and I don't know about those two adults. Now, somewhere along the line, I hope they made a decision for Christ. I don't know. And then actually the one teacher's husband died of a heart attack. And I'm thinking, wow, I, I can understand that, right? News like that comes. I, I can understand how it could just, de I mean, I saw those pictures. They were beautiful people. They were beautiful kids, a beautiful woman, but that doesn't get you to heaven, right? <laughs> doesn't get you to heaven. And he came so that you can do that, so you can be saved. So we need to proclaim the gospel. We need to open our mouths. We have a country that needs to hear the gospel. I praise God for men like Billy, uh, Billy Graham. Franklin Graham is down there setting up with Samaritan's Purse to help these people. And you know what? He won't only just help the people. He's going to share the gospel with these people. And he's going to preach to them. And he's going to do that. And he's going to be the hands and, 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 and the mouth of who? Of Jesus. And, and I'm thankful for those. And there's other groups. And there's churches involved. And I, I don't want to just limit it to that. But we need to get involved. Memorial Day, we're going to have probably family get-togethers. Those times that we can share with our loved ones about the gospel. What Jesus did. Who he was. This world does not know who Jesus is. They do not know. They've got such a mixed up picture. And we've got all these religions put together. And we've got all these vying for in our country under the freedom of religion. And I understand that phrase. But uh, we have groups that are not preaching the gospel and not getting people to heaven. And so we want to make sure that we do that. Just in closing, I do want to say thanks to the 1.2 million men and women that gave their lives for us, that we can meet freely, that we can do so much. You know, it's hard, hard to believe. I, I've never lived in one of those other countries, you know, where you, you can't just go to church. You can't even do hardly anything that we get to do here. You can't speak your mind. You can't even, uh, you know, you, you just they're so limited in their liberty and their freedom. And I thank God that we have, or you're, you're afraid to go out. And you don't say anything against your government, because if you say something against your government, you're pushing up daisies. Now, I have the freedom to speak up my mind against the government, and they have a freedom to speak against what I think, too. <laughs> that comes there. 
but you can't do that in a lot of countries. Go over to Russia and tell Putin he's a snake. Yeah, and you'll find out where snakes live. And uh, you just don't tell him that because he's, he's, he's the man. And he thinks he's what? He thinks he's God, basically. And uh, that's, he's not the first one. And, and Satan gets in and he works through things like that. But one day, Russia's day is coming. I read it in my Bible. <laughs> the big bears are going to come down and God's going to wipe them out. China, Korea, they got two leaders the same way. They don't listen to anything. They do what they want. And they're going to come across that river one day and God's going to what? Wipe them out. Judgment day is coming. They're going to meet who Jesus really is when he comes back as the lion in the tribe of Judah. And he's going to come back and we're going to be on white horses. Whether you ride horses or not, you're going to, you're going to then. You can't fall off and get hurt because you're on God's horses. So, so you don't have to worry about that. And you're going to come riding down and he's going to just take and deal with everything. He's going to take them out with a word. He doesn't have to fight no battles. And you know what? You and I can win battles when we fight them in Jesus' name. So thank God for those. And so I uh, want to make sure that we, we're on the right team. We're riding a white horse. God doesn't care about elephants and donkeys. God said, we're going to ride on a white stallion. And, and I don't want to make politics a thing. Uh, I want to make the gospel the thing and I want to make Jesus Christ the thing because God's saving people in both political parties. And uh, we want to make sure we do that because pol politics can divide. And I hate that, but it can. And I understand we have opposing views. And I know where I stand and I know where some other people stand. But when it comes to showing them the love of Christ, I have to work through that barrier, right? Jesus didn't care if they were Pharisees, Sadducees, or scribes. He just shared the truth with them. He said, there's a heaven, there's a hell. He went to the cross to pay the price for his sins. Where do you want to go?